So anyway, I thought what I'd do is give you a little bit of the history about what brought me into the barbells. I've heard some of yours. Um, when I was a kid, uh, we moved a lot. I was a shy, insecure, fat kid. I hated that kid. Um, and, you know, I, I knew there was something good that I could do and couldn't find it. And like a lot of kids back in the time, and I'm going to date myself, but the Incredible Hulk came out with Lou Ferrigno. There we go. There's the answer. I started asking for barbells. No, no, no. So for years, I mean, when I was 12 years old, I finally went behind mom's back to grandma and said, can I have some barbells? So Christmas comes, I look under the tree, and I'm like, I know what that is. So my first thing I unwrapped was the bar. And we were taking turns unwrapping. The next thing I unwrapped was the box with the plates. The next thing I know, I'm not there. I'm in the back unfinished part of the basement. Two days later, there's still wrapped presents under the tree. Mom was pissed. Anyway, so I started this, this journey. I had the little book that came with it and I started getting the magazines and I'm lifting and pretty quickly it was starting to show a little bit. And hey, this is my thing. And I got the bug big. Um, when I was 13, I lied about my age to get into a contest because you had to be 14. They had a 14, 15 division. So I lifted and then that made it even worse. And the fact that I did pretty well, you know, then it's the, I'm gonna this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be in the magazines, I'm gonna, you know. Okay, so we're going through. And I was real fortunate to have a high school that had a very, very good weight training program. And so I was squatting, deadlifting, doing the Olympic lifts, pressing, and you know, it just, I kept getting stronger and stronger. And got out of high school and I had managed to hook up with a group of guys that were teaching me really well, properly. The only thing was I was crazy. Um, anything they told me to do, I would do, but I was pretty wild. And I find out now that they used to give me these insane workouts, like today you're gonna squat 500 for 10, okay. And they were trying to make me go away. <laughs> if you've seen any of the other uh, interviews, my coach, uh, Marty, did an interview with Rip. And he talks about, we were trying to make this kid go away but we, we couldn't kill him. So anyway, we're going through, and, and I went through, and I won the Teenage Nationals a few times, and it was time to start competing with the men. And I was not getting my squats passed. And I'm wondering what's wrong, I'm having all these issues and everything. And, you know, I got, it was a little dicey for a while. And then I started working with my coach, and we started really beating these things down. So we're going to have to squat deeper. And we started getting on the tune of better, not stronger. Because better will be stronger. But we got to clean up these forms and this and that. And we started thinking a little more technically about everything. And lo and behold, more lifts are getting passed. Bigger numbers are happening. And it's, it's going great. So then, you know, things got going really well. And I went through and, you know, pulled off all of my, you know, the world championships and everything that I won and the world records. And, you know, I'm real happy about all that. But what I'm really happy about now is being able to impart some of the things that I came up with that really help. And I heard a lot of people, I've, I've talked to a few people, and people are asking, what are you thinking about when you're coming into the gym to go do something you haven't done before? And things like that. And it's, oh, I've got answers for all that. So for a lot of that. So anyway, I figured we'd go through some of that. And one thing is, when does the lift start? The lift does not start when you've got the bar on your back and you're standing there getting ready to bend your knees. The lift starts as soon as you set your first foot on that platform and you're going in to go to work. Everything needs to be the same every time. You know, that's what RIP has set up a system to teach everyone to do that. But you go further with that. You're thinking the same things, same individual thoughts, you know, and then you start to realize as you're getting ready to, you know, break your knees, that if you squeeze your scapula together, 
that that seems to help when you're down in the bottom. And, and, and anyway, those little things, you need to make notes of those, mental notes, add it to your list. Because I don't know, you know where you guys are with those things, but when I set foot on that platform and I'm walking to that bar to get, get to work, it's exactly the same thing. You know, roll up. This hand goes on the bar first, this hand. I mean, everything is exactly the same every time. Um, I don't know how many of you all have seen any videos or my video or any of that, but what you will see is exact replication every rep. And once you do that, you're taking some of the variables out. You have a predictable result of what's gonna happen when you get underneath of a barbell. So, that all being said, um, let's see, what was the next part that I wanted to go? Um, okay. So you've got, you've got your mental list and, and your, your, I'm gonna do this, this, you have your steps of how to accomplish this task. How long does it take to do a rep? If you're walking up to the bar and you're gonna take that bar out and set up and do a rep, 20 seconds? Does that seem about right? Okay. You have your steps. You know what you're trying to do. The only reason you're gonna miss that because you've been diligent and you have your <laughs> steps and you know what you're trying to do, the only reason you're gonna miss it is because you fuck it up. Can you not fuck up for 20 seconds? If you can manage to not fuck up for 20 seconds, you're gonna make that lift. I don't care if I don't feel good today, the weights feel heavy today, I'm gonna meet and I'm, no I don't care. If you don't screw it up, it's gonna happen. It's, it's that simple. You're in control of this. So you don't think about, and I heard, I always hear them, but yesterday, I'm gonna try this today. I want to do this today. I'd like to, I'm going to, is what you need to say. Don't even let the I'm gonna try or I want to ever come out of your lips. I'm going to do this. And further back through the day, you've thought about this workout. I'm gonna do this today, okay? I'm gonna do this today. Last night before you went to bed, I'm gonna do this tomorrow. And I'm not gonna fuck up for 20 seconds. And then I'm gonna come home and crack a beer and be a happy camper because I just said a personal best. All right? I've had a lot of people in the past, and you know, especially people with some performance anxiety. And I hit them with that. And I'm like, believe it. Believe that. And watch how many more times that PR happens than something screws up and it doesn't happen. Believe it and be in control, be in charge, be aggressive, okay? So that's one of my favorite ones is the whole, the, the 20 second rule, you know? That's the, all you have to do. The weights are never heavy today because I'm, I'm in my happy place. Not the, it's just a weight, it's just a ballast. Just, it, I actually prefer a barbell to feel heavy on my back. I used to take big warm ups, warm up jumps, and I purposely didn't do things like lockouts and walkouts because, you know, I get underneath a thousand pounds. I don't want that to feel light. I'm coming in, I'm taking control, and everything that happens in here is in my head and under my power. You know, you're, you're riding the same weight, Gra the earth's still spinning the same, so gravity didn't get turned up last night. Okay, um, you, you got your same equipment. Why would this week be worse than last week? Because you put another 20 pounds on a bar? Come on, it's irrelevant. The barbell is just ballast that you're gonna ride up and down and keep in a straight line. It's, it's, that's all it is. And you go in with that, but no, I actually like the weight to be heavy because I'm usually pretty jazzed up when I'm underneath the barbell, but when you stand up and you're getting ready to execute this thing, boom, and it's like, whoa. And, and it's like, yeah, how, how do you, it's like getting hit first in a fight. 
you're on hitting me again. And there's another little gear you can catch and step it up another notch. I actually had times earlier on before I really, really worked on this discipline where I'd take a light weight, oh, this feels great, I'm gonna kill this today. And I didn't give it any respect, I missed it. So it's like, okay, you have to keep things the same every time. 135 is lifted just like 935. It's always the same, every time. You treat every one of them with respect. You beat the shit out of them, but you treat them with respect. And you, you go through, you do your steps, it's the same thing every time. And then when you get to a contest and there's all this other stuff going on, you've done 86 million reps exactly the same way. If, some, if it, a cannon goes off and you get distracted, it probably won't bother you because you're just ingrained on what to do. So, you know, as Mark's teaching, everything the same all the time, you can get the same result, but you got to get your head that way too. You know, oh, I lost five pounds this week. So, <laughs> now if a negative thought comes in, <laughs> if a negative thought does manage to sneak in, you catch yourself and say, what the fuck are you thinking about? Get your head out of your ass and let it, let it go. You know, I was trying to, to get to a point where everything was the same all the time and the technique and this, and little things would occur to me. And I'm like, you know, this week that happened and it really seemed like everything was better after that. So, okay, so in the list of steps of how to squat, instead of 206 things, number 34 got added, now it's 207. Um, it would just add this here and just make it systematic. Be a machinery, you know? It's just real simple, because that's all you're doing. You're taking this, you're moving it out, down, up, you're putting it back. If you were a machine, you'd never miss. Okay, well, we have brains, God help us. Okay, so we gotta at least try and rewire that brain to be a little more systematic and, and, and do the same thing every time. So can you give a, for example, if you were handling someone in the meet, you have a lifter in meet, they go out for the first attempt, and they, they fuck up that 20 seconds and they miss the attempt. You're their coach. How would you get inside their head? Now obviously it depends somewhat on the person. But what would you be your general approach after a miss with the lifter? Because that's what we're kind of thinking here. We go to a meet and we're handling the lifter in meet. How do we get those negative thoughts out and refocus? Well, first thing, coming off, two words. What happened? Especially if it was an opener. Something went way wrong. Okay, what happened? Let's fix this. You know, um, it would be, it, it, like you say, but for the person, whatever. Um, you know, it could be they lost their, you know, it could be something simple. Did you see what happened? That would be the next one. It was like, why did you do this when you were setting up? Okay, we're taking the same thing. You know, anyway, every, you, you can't just generalize exactly what you would do. But there obviously was a reason, especially if we're talking about an opening attempt, something dramatic happened. And depending on it, I might hit him. <laughs> what the, what? Focus is the You're making me look bad. But, but mental focus probably on the openers is one of the biggest things. It could be. But, but if you've got a novice lifter, and you know you, you get somebody and this is going to happen and, and you know they want to do a meet great train them teach them have them on their their system and yeah they're novices so they're not going to be you know this hardcore lunatic like i am but they're gonna they're gonna know what they're doing because you've taught them properly take them to a meet watch a meet or worst case at least spend some time watching meets on, on YouTube, you know, show them what they're getting themselves into. And, and you know, it's, I've taken a lot of people to their first meets and, and it's a blast. And take care of them at that meet. All they should have to do is lift. You turn in there, you know, you take them, come on, we're gonna go weigh you in. We're gonna go get your equipment checked. We're gonna, you know, you take care of it. But this, you tell them what you're doing because next month, oh, I found a meet and you can't go with them. It's like, well, I'm telling you what we're doing and, and, and teach them to be able to help themselves. And what's really, really satisfying is when you teach people 
and they become good, really good, and you know, world champions and things like that. And you're with them somewhere, and you watch them doing the same thing with the next generation. I mean, that's awesome, because I've actually got some situations where I'm four people down from, you know, the guy I taught, taught somebody, he taught somebody, and the next one is in line, and I'm hearing the same stuff coming through. That's awesome. And that's what we're doing here with the whole starting strength thing. Rip has figured out a way, I can, we're gonna teach everyone to power lift. And whether they use it as exercise, or they decide they wanna compete, here's the way to do it. Nobody's ever put it like that and set it up. So here you go, here's the system. But it's, it is damn satisfying when you're looking at generations down. And then when they lift at the meet, and they do well, and you know that you, you know, taught this way. Like, it's like you get children. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it, it, it's really cool. And I think that one of the things missing in most people, you know, everybody spends all this time, you know, you, that you, you're working your diet and, and you know, you're learning to lift and, and, you're, and you're setting up a good structure. But a lot of people miss the whole mental discipline part of it. You know, like, like the day of a meet or, well, the, the day of, of training. Um, I might, if I had to work or something, whatever, I was pretty distracted. But when I walked through the door, I mean, there, there, there's nothing going on in this universe but this workout. Those, those workouts, some of them, especially when you videotape them, they take on lives of their own. They still live and breathe because that was a whole little universe thing going on that day. And it was a cool day. So, you know, you, you just have to go with that. But... Um, well, the whole focus while you're lifting thing I had, I had too much of it. Um, I was crazy. I'd set up a squat and it would be eight, nine steps and I'd be over here. And, you know, I was handling a lot of weight for a kid. And the gym owner came to me one day and said, look, if you don't slow it down, you're not allowed to squat here anymore. And it's like, and there was another nudge to start going this other way. Because if I missed something, I was going to go and bang my head into a cement wall for a little while and get more pissed off and try it again. That was, that was how I handled things. I could, I, could ha I could balance the concentration with the insanity at the same time. And it, it was, that was really great. Well, how about handing it to him like this? You know, you got some guy and, you know, he's trying to squat seven and a quarter. And, you know, you're trying to calm him down and get him thinking harder. It's like, would you like to squat 760 without having to work any harder? What? How, well, how do I do that? Sit down. Let's talk. You know, Let, let's talk about the day you're training and you come into the gym. You know, don't come in... Oh, gee, I, I hope I'm going to get this weight. No, kick the fucking door open, stroll to the squat rack, throw your gym bag down, go change and come out there and tear it apart. You know, be aggressive. But do the same thing every time. You know, that door ended up with a footprint in my gym because every Monday, you know. But, but no, the, the whole thing. Take control of it. Don't come into the gym and start bullshitting with people and this and that. Um, my gym, it was, it was awesome. We developed a group of people there and we had quite a few you know, national and international caliber competitors at the same time. And we ranged from you know, little 97 pound girls to super heavies. So you know, we had quite a few and everybody was the same. Um, <laughs> you get done with a squat and you put it back and you turn around I don't want you to tell me that it was nice and pretty and, man, you're strong today. No, bust my balls. Help me here. Give me something to improve upon. And the best is, you know, you've got this 97-pound little blonde girl with blue eyes. And this 340-pound super you know, throws this bar back and around. He's like, yeah, yeah. And she turns around, he turns around, and she's standing, and she goes, really? That looked like shit. That was like this high. And his dude just, it was devastating. I thought he was gonna cry. <laughs> and he just, you know, did like 750 or something. It was the first time he did it. And she just, boom. There was no crap in that gym. I mean, everybody 
We loved each other, so we punished each other, you know, and everybody lifted well. You're talking about lots of people that are making seven and nine attempts at meets all the time consistently on a national and international level. So nobody's talking, you know. Every now and then we'd have to get on, on a couple of people here or there, but especially, you know, we're all training for like the nationals and it's a month out. If, you're, if they're not talking about what's going on and what you're loading a bar to and stuff, there was no conversation. I was really fortunate to be able to get an environment like that. But if you're not in a situation where you can have that environment, they make these little things called headphones. <laughs> you put those in your ears and you have that environment. You don't have to listen to this bullshit, okay? Wear your headphones, get in your own little world. Concentrate on what you're doing. You know, obviously you're going to have your training partners, but you get that all worked out. I mean, my main training partner was this monster, six foot three, 320 pound gorilla, um, Big Bob. And I'd be in, and I'd have the bar on the squat rack and, you know, getting everything squared away. He'd come rolling in the gym. We'd make eye contact. And that was, that was hello. There wasn't even a nod. It was like, <laughs> good, you're here. And, and, and that was it. Then when we got done, yeah, well, maybe we'd, we'd, we'd shoot the breeze a little bit. Not in the power room. You had to go out there. On bench days, <laughs> um, I came up with a thing that on bench day, you're punching your time card on that bench that day. That's where you're going to work, right? Why the fuck are you sitting on my bench? Get your ass up and go get a chair. No sitting on benches today. This is where you work. And you know, like I said, some of these things get, do get over the top, I understand. But this is how far I'm willing to go to have this mindset tuned up. You know, I'm eating 14 goddamn meals a day. I'm waking up twice a night to eat. For an hour and a half, let's have some mental discipline in the goddamn gym. You know, how far can you take it? So we would, we would come up with things. And then when I'd have my guys, there were times you'd get into some of this performance anxiety stuff. And so I used to torture these poor bastards. I'd come up, I would sit when I wasn't like in, in heightened mode and think of, you know, random bizarre things I could make as a rule in the gym that day. And we did a whole training cycle. Anybody that squatted with me, the, lo the smallest plate you could put on a bar was a 25. No 10s, no 5s, and well, you, two and a halves weren't allowed on, on, on a man's bar in that gym anyway, period. No two and a halves. The chicks can use them, not the dudes. And if I saw you with one, you got, you got reamed. And, no, and none of those communist 35 pound plates either. I, no. <laughs> I used to actually, when like two of them would be handy, I'd grab them and I'd take them over to the aerobics room and just throw them over. But no, nothing less than a 25. This dude's got all mad. You can't do that. I'm like, watch. So you get creative. You need 100, 345s, you know, two, you know, anyway, you juggle those around. But they said, well, what if they, I still can't do it. And I'm like, go up. <laughs> Instead of 725, you're 735. What? Why don't you go out to your car, open the glove box, grab your balls, <laughs> put them on it, come back in and train with us men. What's 10 pounds gonna do? It's just ballast. So anyway, just, you know, and, and, and a few people were asking, you know, well, what are you thinking about? And, and you know, well, there's, there's a little glimpse into, you know, how I used to approach all that. And I really, I got to the point I'm in the gym, I'm working out. I'd say that I was happy because that's where I really was in my best element. But when I was really training her, I wasn't really very happy. I was usually pretty angry and upset and, and pretty raged up. But that's my favorite place to be anyway. So that's how I managed it. And really, it, stuff didn't go wrong. I would go whole training cycles and not miss one rep in the squat. 16 weeks and not miss. And, you know, there's five or six of those in one or two where there's one misdrap over the course of five years. So, you know, it does, it works. 
And you know, it takes a little extra work, but you're in there, you're doing the same thing anyway. So, you know, let's get strong mentally as well as physically. And they, they, they both help each other. Literally, my last squat workout was 13 days before the meet. Um, I stopped doing that. I'm gonna go to my opener the week before the meet because it, it goes against everything that I'm talking about right now. You're coming into the gym knowing yeah, you're just saying, man, I'm just doing my opener to get some blood going. And, and God forbid, you don't treat that with the full respect it deserves. And it's not a real easy opener. And then you got to dwell on that for the next six or seven days un un until you're at the meet. Because that had happened to me a long time ago. And I'm like, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to rest. Um, bench was usually a, an eight day out. Deadlift was 10 days just because I always ended up lifting on Sunday. And I had Monday, Thursday, and Saturdays, those training days. But, um, and it's always, for me, an all forward thing. Um, you're getting ready for an attempt. And you go up, and you're going to the bar. And this actually happened to me, um, I did a meet in 2004, that I kind of broke out of retirement and I was playing. And I laid down on the bench for my third attempt. And as I'm laying down, I hear them announce the number. It was wrong. So I sat up and I turned to my coach. I said, that's supposed to be this. And you, you know, it's even on the video. And so I'm like, so I get up and I go over, fix it with the scorer's table. Now I hadn't competed in eight years. And I'm standing there and I'm like, fuck, man, I got a bum shoulder. This is my third attempt. I didn't need that. And it's like, what? Dude, did you ever do this before in your life? What the hell is wrong with you? I walked off the platform, watched him fix it, took a couple of breaths, boom. Now, unfortunately, I'd like to tell you I came out, I got that lift. I didn't. But I wasn't going to get that one anyway. I mean, you know, just the whole way I brought it down and everything. But walk off the platform. If you're going up to a bar, you're getting ready to lift, you notice, oh, I forgot to put a collar on it, which, God help you, but you notice something's wrong and it needs to be fixed. Fix it. Don't grab that bar. Walk off the platform. Okay, step one. Step on the platform. Get your momentum back. Don't break things up. Say you're setting a squat up and it's wrong for whatever reason. Put it back. In a meet, you're allowed to put the squat back as long as you haven't gotten the squat signal. Put it back, walk off the platform, start over. Keep everything flowing the way it's supposed to be. Eliminate variables. If that, if that rep had gone perfectly, you wouldn't have done any of that. You would have gone straight to it, done your business. Since you're used to doing these steps in the order they belong, don't set yourself up. Walk off, take a breath, start over, okay? So everything is, once you decide, okay, it's time for me to lift this thing, this is, this is the way to go about that and, and really be much more successful than saying, okay, I'm ready to try this now. I can't even really recall a time, I, I think there might have been a time or two like something happened and I said, no, I'm not taking that deadlift. Something's hurt or something. But, you know, I was always, you know, just, yeah, really gung-ho. One of the biggest mistakes I ever made, I was in Finland in 95 and it was the meet after I had set the 1003. And I was being conservative at that meet actually and I took a third attempt squat of 970. And it bounced up like if I would have let go, it would have flown into the racks. And, and they're like, do you want a fourth attempt? And I'm like, 38 pounds. And I'm like, no, because my training had come up to where I'm at the, it, it's hard to set world records at the world championships because you're in some god awful, Budapest or someplace living on bologna and cheese for a week. Um, so uh, I had planned and, and, and was very calculated up to easily set a, a world record in a total. 
So I'm like, no, I need the 970 squat. My bench was up, my deadlift was up. So turn down that fourth attempt and I'm pretty confident that one would have, would have popped. And uh, had a lousy liftoff guy on the bench, a real high narrow bench, and he was just going like this. So I got my opening bench, second and third missed because he handed them off and I'm all over the place. So the total record's gone on that one. And then I only pulled one deadlift. I was dropping the others and I'm like, why didn't I take that squat? But see, you know, I got Jekyll and Hyde working on, it, on me over here, you know. Hyde's a lot of fun to listen to, but he's a crazy bastard. And Jekyll's the one that's like, oh, turn down that fourth attempt and, and get that world record total, you know. Hyde's the one that made me do that thousand pound double. You know, it would have been smarter to listen to him. So I had to deal with these two idiots in my head and try and figure out which one to listen to on a given day. And, you know, they both have their percentages about even about being right. But, you know, what do you do? And, yeah, the whole fourth attempt thing, um, I've, I've taken them and I've turned them down, you know, at the same time. Because at the bigger meets like that, they don't even do the fourth attempt thing anymore. But in, at the IPF Worlds, you're going to lift one weight class at a time. So you got 10, 13 people. You all lift. Then you go. But after the squats are over, and I was always the last squatter, they gave you 10 minutes to warm up for the bench. And you were out there benching. The whole meet would take two and a half hours. But what I would do is you have a minute to follow yourself and three minutes to take the attempt on a fourth. So I'd call for it and buy four extra minutes of warm-up time. The crowd used to get pissed because they're all like, yay, we're going to see another. And then I never showed up. You know, you'd hear them. I'm in, I'm, in my, I'm in my underwear pulling my super suit off, doing a bench warm-up. And they're all like, yay. Oh. <laughs> As I watch it more and more, I needed to figure out a way to get the bar another half an inch down my back. If I could have figured that out, it would have been huge. It would have been another 50 pounds. And on the deadlift, because of my thigh problem, you know, being that they were 34 inches, um, my grip was out too wide. Then on top of it, I had a lousy grip, and that compounded the problem. When I deadlift now, I have figured out a way to get closer. And with these two things looking me in the face, I, this is the first time anybody ever asked me that. And it's like, how did I not see this? But um, those are two, the two immediates, like instant, this would bring a result. Um, I would have waited a couple year, more years to quit. One of the reasons I, well, one of the big main reasons I quit, I retired in 96. Uh, the Olympics really pissed me off. It's here in Atlanta, and I'm not lifting at it. And to get my second set of gold medals, because I would have won in 92, and I would have won in 96. Um, you know, not to be a jerk or anything, but that's the way it was. So I thought, if I slowed down a little bit, I might be able to prolong the length of my career. So, you know, I was still, you know, handling some good weights and everything, but I wasn't banging, just banging, banging, banging. So 2000 came, no Olympics. 2004 came. That's why I, one of the reasons I did the raw meet, I'm like, well, I don't have to hold up for anything anymore because I'm definitely not going to be lifting in 2008 and, you know, trying to lift it at a high level like that. Plus, organizationally, the sport is full of so many retards of, of, of frogs on, you know, big frogs on little li lily pads doing these stupid lifts with ridiculous equipment. I, I don't want to get started. I'll start breaking things. Um, <laughs> I can, I've almost quit Facebook because these friggin' douchebags are putting these, oh, look at my squat. And, you know, he's out of a monolift. He doesn't have to walk out. He goes like this. And people are telling him how good it is. And I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my fist through the computer monitor. <laughs> and, and, and everybody is really cool to me. And, and I really appreciate everybody being nice to me, you know, because um, I lifted well. So I don't want to be one of those assholes that gets on the, oh, da, 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 da. I don't do that. You know, it's just like the YouTube stuff, 
then you get the, the idiots that put in something. I'm not responding to any of that mess. You know, like I say, I go places to meets and everybody's really cool and have a, make new friends and have a good time. So I'm not gonna, gonna be a hater. So, you know. Well, after the Nationals, unfortunately, we kept trying to get them to move it to June. We'd get them to move it to June and then they'd put it back to July. You got a week off and it was time to get back in at, at over 50%. Um, after the Worlds, I took a month, and I would go out of my way to make sure that I didn't see a gym. I, I, I really would. It was funny, because I'd tell people that, and, and then we'd be going somewhere, and they'd say, why are you going this way? I'm like, there's a gym over there. I don't even want to drive by one. It was one of my funny mental discipline things. <laughs> I'm taking such a break, I'm not even going to see a gym for a month. And I would do things like that. And of course, I entertain myself doing things like that. But, you know, I sit at home. My, my girlfriend will talk about it sometimes. She's like, he is. He's just like this at home. He's sitting there. And I turn around and look. And he's, he's laughing at something. And she's like, I don't want to know. Don't want to know. Uh, you know, because I spent too much time as a kid being unhappy to not be happy. So I'll do things just to amuse myself. And, you know, some of them get a little bizarre. I need, to, I need to make sure I take those purple pills more often. <laughs> yeah, I hate lifting when my stomach's growling. You know? So there was that line, you need to make sure you have something in your stomach, but not too much. So I, I don't really have a good answer for you on that one. You know, but um, constantly, uh, somebody in my group would have the job of whenever they saw me, um, and I didn't have water in my hand, they were to, somebody was supposed to put a water in my hand, and as soon as someone put a water in my hand, I had to you know, at least take a good chug, and I walked around with it. But of course, I'd do something, I'd set it down, and you know, a few minutes later, so I had to hydrate. And like I said, I, you know, everybody was, was conscious of the fact, and, and it's like, he didn't have a water, go give him a water. So I always, had some going, and if I managed to put one down, within a couple of minutes, somebody put one and I had to drink from it immediately. So the, 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 that's a big one. I was a horrible cramper. What would happen to me, it was this ab. And especially, as we got done benching and we're warming up in the deadlifts, and about my third deadlift warm up, that ab would catch, roll out, and down, and you could see it. And it, would, it was, you know, about like half of my fist sticking out. And it was excruciating. So then, so in the hole for your opening attempt deadlift, Kurt Karwaski, and I'm like, oh, fuck. <sighs> Pull my belt on, and, you know, I'm going out there. And, I mean, I almost always had to deal with this, these cramps when I was deadlifting. The hydrating helped. Uh, I still don't know why that used to happen. And it was, it was right here. And so, you know, we did the best we could to fight it. But yeah, it didn't make deadlifting very fun. But, you know, hitting in here again. But, you know, a whole other thing, you know, dealing with pain and stuff. Um, you know, if you're injured in the gym, yeah, maybe you better cut that workout. But, you know, okay, I've got a cramp. Should I do this set? You know, these kind of things. Um, you have to evaluate those. And my thinking with was, well, I'm at a meet, and all, all, game, all game bets are off, you know. Um, I've t torn many times at meets, torn something, finished that lift, took the next one, went on to the, you know, the, then the, you know, this, that, the other. You're at a meet, it's a whole different game then, you know. Now maybe if I like broke my leg, I might have not tried one, but no, I mean, <laughs> That, you know, that was life or death time. Um, in the squat, I used to really put forth an effort early in the cycle, and we'd be trying to do some leg sled work and things like that. But you, you start getting to the point where, you, you know, you just did a, a set of five with, you know, 850 pounds in the squat. So now you unload that, and you got several trips all the way into the other room carrying 100 pound plates back and forth and back and forth. And you, and you get this thing all loaded up and you talk your training partners into climbing on top of it. 
So I got these two big apes standing on top of this pile of crap, and it's taking 15 minutes to get it all together. And you can lay down and do a set of eight with it. You're not getting anything out of it, but the cardio from carrying all the damn plates, and I, I don't do cardio, oh no, that's not gonna happen. So I, I tried. And then I tried to find substitutes, but you know, okay, you know, you squat 940 for a triple. Oh, I'm gonna go out now and do one-legged leg extensions. Go home, eat a steak. It's gonna be a whole lot better for you. Um, so for me, the, the, the extra leg work, it was a waste of time. You know, squat. Squat harder, do an extra rep on that set and, and call it a day. Um, I used to, on Tuesday, I did an arm day. I'd do close grip benches and you know a couple of kinds of curls and a couple of tricep exercises. It wasn't a real high day, um, but one of the things it did is I squatted the day before. Gave me a chance to stretch out because I'd be a pretty knotted up dude on Tuesdays. And then Thursday I had deadlift and I had a uh, hybridized shrug that I used to do. It's kind of a shrug and high pull combination and I did heavy T-bar rows, um, and we had a lat stack that was really, really heavy, so you know, I'd do a few of those. And then maybe some dumbbell shrugs if I wasn't totally trashed. And then you know, those, I'd pull and, and hold for three counts, and a set of eight of those, and that would do it. I wasn't gonna be able to see a car beside me on the way home. Um, bench, you know, it was like you'd bench, then I'd do wide grip benches, inclines, and then I had a, a series of you know, five or six other things, and every cycle I'd kind of mix them up, whether it would be a decline or you know, some sort of overhead thing. Or, you know. But I'd always mix those up. So every cycle that would be different. But generally you know, it would be, except for squats, it's the primary and four accessories. You know, three, two, three sets maybe. But the heavier you go, as you're doing your accessory work, if you're doing eights in the squat and you're gonna do leg presses, you do eights. If you're doing fives, you do fives. So your accessory work gets heavier as you go, but five, six weeks out from the meet, depending on how my joints would feel, okay, it's time to start dropping accessory work. And by three weeks out, you're benching and you're going home. There's, there's nothing. But you start dropping stuff because, you know, oh, my elbow's starting to bother me, my knees, this, that, the other. Drop the accessory work. It's just accessory work. It's great and it helps, but it's time to be healed. So it gave you a little more, more uh, regeneration time. When I, when I really got to the heyday, you know, a few years in the, in the 90s there, there were a couple of times when a situation came up and, you know, I better watch what I'm doing. If I, if I came in and, and all this good stuff that I'm saying, you know, let's say I have a shitty meet and go three for nine. I got somebody here that I might have to worry about. And when I got into those situations, I would behave a little more conservatively with attempt calling. But it was really good because I always lifted really well at those, you know, eight for nine. Uh, my whole career, I never managed to make a nine for nine day. Just something, you know, my very last world championship, my last deadlift, I pulled it. I'd made, I was, I was eight for eight. I pulled it and I'm standing there and it starts to slip. So my hand went like this, but I managed to get it. So it, it, it descended a half an inch, but I stopped it down. I put it down and I'm like, and they called me for that. The bar descended after the, the top. I was like, oh. But yeah, I never pulled off a nine for nine. But when I did have a competitive area, um, it seemed like there was a, a gear there that I could catch and, and I, I would lift better. So it would have been interesting to have a dog fight every time you come in, but I don't know, that might have been a little more stressful. <laughs> you know, it was fun to go in and, 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 and just play. And, you know, you're playing hard and, and, you're, and you're trying to perform. But, you know, it, it definitely was a, a whole different thing. Well, yeah, we were competitive, but these were the guys that taught me. And, and uh, you know, they're, they're my buddies. And, 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 you know, and they were, they were always like, God damn that kid. 
you know? You know, I remember the day I was like 19 and in the gym I squatted eight and a quarter. And the guys are like, fuck. You know, because, you know, they're right there and they're like, oh no, the kid. We couldn't make that son of a bitch go away. But um, no, it was, it was different because we were competitive, but it wasn't, it would have been better if I had someone I disliked. So, I, you know, I didn't really have all that. Um, you know, the, the big one was in 1990, you know, I turned 24 and it's time to, no more junior world championships. We're going to the worlds, we're going to the show and I got to take on the three time defending world champion. And Kjosti Vilmi from Finland. So squatting, I out squatted him, set a world record, missed my third attempt which would have been a, a, another world record that day. Made all my benches, tied a PR bench. Deadlift, he was a better deadlifter, so I opened up, I'm winning. He opens up, he's winning. I had done my homework, I knew what this guy could do. So, took my second attempt, which was a personal best, I'd never pulled before. Smoked it, I'm winning. And he was one of these deadlifters that rolls the bar out and he rolls it back and, and they're just ugly pulls. So I'm thinking he's not gonna get his second. So he pulls his second. So I'm like standing there and okay, I'm in uncharted. I've never deadlifted this much ever. And I'm trying to call another number. What can I hold on to today? You know, I was, so I turn in at his tent and Ed Cohn comes running over. What'd you take? I was 7.16, he goes, won't do it, you need more than that. You gotta take 7.22. Okay, so you're allowed to change, so we changed it. So, you know, here I am, I'm at the World Championships and, and the, crowd's, the crowd's loving me because I set that world record squad. So they're tearing the place apart and I smoked yet a second PR deadlift for the first time. I'm standing there holding it, getting ready to put it down. I'm like, this is what it's like. This is what it's like. And I mean, it was incredible. Five minutes later, I watched that asshole pull his. <laughs> Lost by five pounds. The next year, I was, I was horrible to be around in the gym for the next year. I was, I was just raged about this. So the next year comes and I'm like, here we go. He didn't show. <laughs> I, I was pissed. Uh, the following year, he showed up and went up a weight class. The following year, I dropped a weight class down at 242. He showed up, but then didn't even lift. And I never heard anything from him again. But I was like, I just want to take him. And, uh, you know, he, he wouldn't let me uh, have that back. So um, we, I got into a situation, this was, I've, I've learned a few interesting things. I used to have a, uh, a guy who won the world championships at 220 a long time ago. And here I am a teenage lifter in the state and I'm of enough caliber that I could win the men's open division. So I'm competing in that. This jack hole is competing at the state championships. Taking that trophy away, that would have meant something to me. I mean, I'm a teenager, that would have been a cool thing, you know? No, I'm never going to be like that. And, you know, if I went to the state meet because I was coaching people, but I had to bench that day, and I'm going to bench, well, I'm going to lift as an extra lifter. I'm not going, no. I don't, the trophy thing. This dude was a trophy hound. Anyway, um, the Vilmi thing. In 93, getting ready for the world championships, I tore my quad. Eight weeks out. I was trying to hit an 880 set of five. Went down with the fourth one, and when I popped to come up, it just poof. So, trying to figure out what to do. And the first thing, everyone in the gym, thank God we didn't have the internet back then. This is how long ago this was. Um, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. I gotta see what happens here. So, didn't squat the next week, came back two weeks later. I couldn't squat 550. I couldn't get down to squat 550. And it's six weeks before the world championships. What do you do, what do you do, what do you do, what do you do? Don't tell anybody. So, 
melting glaciers every week and pushing my way through and pushing and pushing. I got to the meet and managed a 903 squat. And the whole way down, I'm like, please don't blow out. Please don't blow out. And managed to win it. But I usually, I don't want to get too graphic with this part. Um, I was having a real rough couple of years with, you know, personal stuff. And I'm thinking, you can't lift in this meet. <laughs> I had a, uh, no, this is being taped. Um, I had, I made a decision that I would rather go and let someone take my title from me because I was hurt than to give it away. And because that's what I learned from that guy. Come on, man. Let me have, let, let, I, you know, I want to take it. Don't abdicate the throne. But anyway, um, you know, that was one, and, and, and um, that was one of the best decisions I ever made because my whole thing was I wanted to do a bunch of them in a row and that would have broken that. But, um, you know, I, I, it's one of the meets. I didn't really lift that well or anything, but I'm really proud about having the balls to show up for that and say, oh, Red Rover, and there was a guy from Iceland and Russia, and they were pulling deadlifts to beat me on the third attempts. As a matter of fact, on the second attempts, they were fighting it out for second. I thought they were fighting it out for, for first. And when they're all clapping because they got those, I thought I was already stuck in third. And then when I dropped <laughs> my third deadlift, I'm like, well, you set yourself up for this. And then they went through all that, and then people start coming over to me, and I'm like, get away from me. I'm, I'm kind of upset right now. And the coaches figured out, whoa, 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 Kirk, Kirk, wait a minute, wait a minute. You realize you just won, right? And I'm like, don't fuck with me. <laughs> They're like, no, 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 relax. Because I, you know, I was kind of actually in a corner, and I was, I, you know. <laughs> but um, you, know, you make decisions like that, and you learn things about yourself. And you can do that every workout. You know, come in and say, man, I can't believe I'm going to try and squat 500 pounds today. Okay, well, use some of that mental toughness that I'm trying to, you know, impart to you. It'll happen. And then, you know, you can go home and pat yourself on the back. And it makes this a whole lot more fun. When I was 12 years old, after lifting for about two weeks, I was going to be on the magazines and I was going to set world records. And that's all anyone heard about. It must have been really miserable to be around me when I was a kid, you know, because I was really very outspoken about the whole thing. This is what's going to happen. You don't understand. You know, all my friends are talking about, I'm going to be a pro baseball player. It's like, no, you're not. This is going to happen. I know this. All I got to do is bust my ass and do, it, do the best I can, and this is going to happen. And, you know, luckily it worked out. But it, it really, it's still kind of amazing because... I'm sure a couple of variables could have happened and it would have been very different. But I look back on it and it's like, it's amazing that I knew I could pull this off before I started doing it. Eight years old, give me barbells, give me barbells. One of the funny things that came up, um, strength was always a thing for me. And I remember, I don't know how old I was. I'm trying to remember which house, but I was probably, I don't know, four, five. And I was really pissed off that I couldn't get the gallon of milk up on the counter. You know, I was this little kid. What little kid is worried about that? Here's, you know, up the stairs, here's the milk, mom. And I'm like trying to get it on, and I, you know, I kept trying, I couldn't get it on there. <laughs> so, yeah, I was definitely wired wrong from the beginning, but, what do you, you know, you gotta find things where you, you fit into a niche. Um, watching videos of myself, technically, there are things that I look for, and, I, and I'm, I'm pretty good with the angles and, you know, I mean, spent a lot of time watching films developing my technique. And there were things that I'm like, I need to get my knees, I need to this, I need to that. And I'm trying to do it, and I'm thinking about doing it, and I can't make my body do what I'm telling it to. Getting worn out. So the bustle's accommodating and everything, but I wanted to lift in the Olympics. And I still thought there was a chance that it might happen. So that's why I kind of lightened up for a while 
and you know, to give myself a chance for powerlifting to hopefully get their shit together so I could go to the Olympics. And well, you know, it was a thought. Um, if I went back in time, I would have stayed a couple more years. But like I said, my, you know, some technical things are starting to deteriorate. And it's like, at what point is this going to deteriorate enough that something's really going to pop and get hurt? That I really want to put myself through all of it. You know, the, the 14, you know, to try and go back and, and be as intense and everything. And I don't know that I want to go in. Not, if I want to do that, that's where I want to be. I don't want to be half-assed. So I really love this. I mean, this, this was the greatest thing for me of all time. And I feel like I owe it my best if I'm going to do it. So I don't want to halfway do it. And I don't know, that's a little weird, but, you know, let's get better. We don't have to work so hard. Not that we mind the work, but we can work smarter and get a lot better results than we can busting our asses. And, and you know, just systematically improving everything. So, you know, we, we kind of turned a whole corner. Both of us did. So, yeah, Marty was, was crucial. Can't believe I've been, we've been tight for 30 years now. Eddie taught me to be, leave a rep in the gym. If you, you know, when, when I would call Eddie, he'd say, so, what'd you do? And see, when you ask about the competitive thing, I had Eddie and on the phone. We lifted like on the same days. So Monday night, hey, Eddie, all right, what you got? I squatted 850 for five. He's like, ha, I did 860. <laughs> and my straps were down. Fuck you. But so, you know, we, we, we had all this, but he was always like, so how was it? I'm like, it was good, which meant there was probably another rep in the tank. Leave one because when you do a rep that is just an a awful ball buster, you just did like the work of doing three reps. And so you add that, if that was your fifth rep, so what, you just did seven, eight reps worth of work, and it wasn't productive work. That's gonna impact you the following week. So you wanna work, but not overwork. And then, you know, there's, there's, then there's the whole other one. How many reps worth of work is it when you go in and you miss one? And I don't know the whole science of it, somebody does. But when you totally miss one and you're grinding and you, and you don't get to overcome that force, that's a soreness the next day that is just not good. And, you know, it, um, I don't know, maybe it was my attitude. And well, luckily you didn't miss much. So <laughs> when you don't miss much, you don't have that pain. If Eddie would have seen that video, he was like, dude, just do, just, just do one and, and get it over with. And, you know, I, you know Jekyll, Jekyll was telling me that, but you know, then there's this other side and it's like, what if I could do that? That would be cool. And you know, I, I really put myself through a lot of mental and emotional bullshit getting, getting cranked up for that. But we're standing here talking about it. That was in 1995, right? This is almost 20 years later and we're standing here talking about it. It was yeah. absolutely yeah. worth it. It was absolutely yeah. worth it. If, if I had not done that and squatted 1,042 on my third attempt at the meet like I thought I was going to, it wouldn't have been a worthwhile trade-off. Because I, I would still, I would have nightmares periodically about whether or not I could have done it or not if I had tried. I would. I know me, you know. So there are times that you, because of the mental discipline thing and all this hard mental work and and you know you can tune your, your mind and brain to a degree. And there are times it's just fucking Christmas in the gym. And <laughs> take it, take it, you know. Um, it, it's worth it sometimes to take that risk. So you know, um, various times, you know, you're just having this workout, it's just flying, go ahead. You deserve it because you've been busting your ass. You deserve a Christmas gym day every, every now and then. And you know, when it's there, take it. You could use the F word, but don't use the fucking I word around me. 
There's no thoughts of injuries when you're lifting. You know, I, I mean, that, that's, leave that in the glove box. You know, when you take your testicles out of the glove box, put, <laughs> put the I word in there. You know, put them in your pocket. I've been talking about all this positive stuff. That's the worst word in the dictionary in the gym. Uh, you don't want that one getting in your head because it's the worst thing that happens. You know, you're missing a time. That sucks. You're hurt. You're in the hospital. You know, no, 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 no. This is, you, you, you got to leave that one alone. If you're doing everything the same all the time and you're concentrating on what you're doing and you don't fuck up for 20 seconds several times while you're working out that day, you're not going to get an injury anyway. Yeah. The days after meets were, were, it was another thing that I, an observation I made. When you lifted really well and, you know, made most of your attempts and, you know, and everything, the next day, you know, you're tight and sore, but it's like, man, I don't feel all that bad. But, I mean, you have one of those shitty four for nine days and miss some attempts and stuff, and it's like, just, oh, does the hotel have a wheelchair? <laughs> uh, too much negative energy. But, yeah, it, it does. But... Well, what else? What else are you gonna do? We can start smoking crack or something. That might be healthier. <laughs> Training was awesome because Training gets you through this. because all that bullshit's outside the gym door. That's sitting in the car. In here, it's quiet. The voices in my head aren't annoying me right now. I'm doing my thing. I'm concentrating on this. The other voices are talking at that point, and, and they're pretty weird too, but they're fun to be around. You know, they're, they're doing shots of tequila and stuff, and you know, we're having a good time in the gym. But all that bullshit was outside, and a lot of it had me really upset, and it was a, 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 a vehicle for me to externalize that. And, you know, yeah, actually, personal drama is usually really good for my training. Because, you know, I can get this pissed off. And if I work real hard, I can get a little more pissed off than that. If I can channel that through against the bar, you know, it helps. So at least for me, that, that, that worked out. You guys will have plenty of time for questions tomorrow afternoon. So any of you write down, we'll get answered. We're going to go ahead and try to be responsible adults here and stay on schedule, which is the the goal of all conferences, and uh, let's take a little break. Thanks, Kirk, for coming.